Uh, Ed Crapo has been our, our local property appraiser since 1981. And when I listen to him talk about his stories, it's amazing that he is in such good shape. Uh, he's not worn away to a nub because it's not a relaxed uh, environment that he is uh, paying. So he can tell, I'm sure, some, uh, some remarkable war stories, if you will, about uh, dealing with the public and de with dealing with the countervailing forces, I guess you would say, uh, that, uh, that focus on, on his office. I mean, after all, there's an enormous amount at stake in, uh, in, uh, in, in the decisions and the processes that he's responsible for. So he's been there since 1981. He's watched this community double in size or more and watched the property values. Uh, go even further than that. And he also has brought us in that time from pre-electronics, pre-internet, to a world of electronics and internet, which has enormous implications for an office such as his. Now you will have to look on the website to see that, that he has, 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 has adapted to that and, uh, and in fact has become a leader in his profession in uh, making that uh, transition. Uh, he's been extremely active over the years with associations involved in this process and a leader there. He's uh, with the International Association of Assessing Officers. He's been their president. He's been on the executive board, on the executive committee, and a host of other special committees uh, dealing with the issues that surround that office. He's uh, involved with the American Society of Appraisers. Uh, he's also involved with the Florida Association of Property Appraisers and has again been their president and involved in the leadership and a member of the legislative committee. And he could you know, you know, talk to him very long to understand how critical that relationship is uh, in making his office function. And, uh, and so uh, he's also been on the Florida Advisory Council for Intergovernmental Relations, again, for very good reasons, very compelling reasons. He was appointed to that office by the governor. Uh, in 2011, very recently, he was uh, recognized by the International Association of Assessing Officers as their member of the year, which I think is a remarkable uh, statement about his uh, role and contribution. And uh, he hails from, uh, Chris uh, just found out a few moments ago, he hails from Hobart College, which is Chris's uh, uh, graduation point. So, uh, uh, so that's another qualification. And Ed, we're delighted to have you here. Welcome. Thank you so very much, Dr. Archer. Um, good afternoon. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try something a little. I'm going to actually do something I haven't done in a long time. I'm going to give you a presentation without PowerPoint. Now, generally speaking, you know, I have like charts and graphs, so I use PowerPoints. It always keeps, lets me know where I am and whatever it is I'm trying to tell you. Um, this time I didn't have charts and graphs. So I started plucking images out, you know, just to tell me where I was. It started looking a lot like the book I've been reading with my five year old grandson. And then, this isn't going to do it. So we're going to, I'm going to try to just do this from my written notes. And the other thing I want to tell you right up front is um, there's nothing that's off limits. If there's something you want to ask me about, you want to talk about, um, you know, have at it. Interrupt me. Let's go for it. Um, I'm truly honored to be here today. You know, I mean, wow. A tax assessor is the distinguished, you know, the, the Alfred A. Ring distinguished speaker. That's a big deal. I don't know how big it is for you, but it's a huge deal for me. And, and I'm, I'm just very flattered to have been invited and, and appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts with you today. Now, I've got to tell you, when I was first approached about speaking this fall, I thought it was going to be a classroom situation, and, that, uh, and I was pretty excited about it. And the reason I was excited about it is because somebody asked me to do a classroom out here several years ago. And I haven't been invited back since. <laughs> and, um, and I'll tell you that that's apparently intentional. Um, I asked the person that I, I showed up for, you know, sometime later, you know, how to go. And in, and, in, and in the most polite and articulate terms, it was explained to me that essentially, a bomb. 
And I, I didn't bring what they wanted. I didn't talk about anything they were interested in. I just missed the boat. Um, if I go that way, somebody ask an interesting question. Let's, let's change the direction, <laughs> okay? Um, I don't want to repeat the experience, but um, you know, when I finally opened the email and, 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 and decided, well, I will tell you, you know, I mean, I've been working on that redemption presentation, by the way, for several years. You know, you know when you can't sleep at night, well, you know, if I ever get the chance, this is what I'm going to do. Um, when I finally opened the email to find out what it was I was going to do, uh, oops, I got something I've been working on for a couple of years, and that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to do something totally different. So I struggled with um, a lot of different ideas. Um, I mean, I just, I am a tax assessor, and of course I find certain things about a tax assessor fascinating, but I couldn't imagine y'all really listening to me talk about tax assessment for 90 minutes. I wasn't certain I could listen to myself do it either. So um, I cast around thinking about some things. And, and what finally happened is um, I, I kept coming back through, through um, one thought. You know, and that thought was change, which was um, eventually what I sent in as my topic. Now I did get a phone call this morning that told me that that apparently wasn't acceptable. So I had to give you all a new subtopic. I forget what, what I don't know, reflections on the history of uh, property taxes in Florida and appraisal valuation, which I'm going to do a lot of. Um, but um, there, there was an incident um, this summer during the campaign while I was running for office that um, also made me choose change. I mean, change has been on my mind a lot, but I was being interviewed by a reporter for my candidacy. You know, this is going to be, you get two stories, you know. You get one that you get to write, and the newspaper puts it there, and then you get one that they write. This is the one they're going to write. Now, they've assigned this reporter to do my race, who doesn't cover the county. He doesn't know who the property appraiser is or what he does. He's got no background for it. And he's um, under-enthusiastic about what's about to happen. Um, he did do a pretty good job of preparing himself for the report, which I have to give him credit for. We set up an appointment, he missed it. He didn't even show up. So now, some of you may end up running for political office, but very few of you probably already have. I mean, when, the new, when a reporter doesn't show up for your article, you know, and everything, you get, you get anxious. Um, so anyway, we finally get together. I rearrange all sorts of things to make it happen. You know, I'm thinking this guy ought to be a little bit on my side, you know. The interview is going and it's not going well. It doesn't, I mean, it feels uncomfortable. It's going, you know, all of my instincts are on alert, you know. Has this guy got an agenda? You know, is there some other thing he wants to say? You know, what, what's, what's going on here? You know, so I'm, you know, I'm trying to figure all that out. When all of a sudden he just asked me, he said, okay, all your years in office, what's the most important thing you've learned? I thought, okay, let me see. My first thought is, well, you've got to ask my opponent the same questions, right? What's my opponent going to say? I've been in office 32 years. He's never been in office. But we cast that out. I was actually speechless. I had no idea what to say. I mean, I just, I, I racked my brain. You know, I've been president of the world in terms of assessors. I've been 32 years in office. I took, I took an office from, um, well, cardboard cards with all the information on it filed in a file cabinet, uh, a manual information system. If you wanted any property information, you literally had to get in the car, drive downtown, and come and ask us to see it. But if somebody had been there before you and we hadn't refiled the card yet, we couldn't find it, so you'd have to come back. You know? I mean, I took, actually, to publish a website or to get on the Internet and to publish to the website all of our information. Um, I launched the first successful local government GIS system in the state of Florida. I, uh, let's see, what else did I, I mean, 
Well, I had survived six months of investigation by the FBI, Gainesville Sun, Florida Department of Law Enforcement, and the, and the State Attorney's Office. I'd made it through that. I made it through an assault by the county manager in the Gainesville Sun to try to get me removed from office for, for facetious or fallacious reasons. I thought, okay, so what have I learned? I mean, I learned a lot. I've seen a lot, I've been through a lot. I've experienced a lot, I led a lot, I did a lot. What's the one thing, you know, what's gonna really be meaningful to say here? You know, what's gonna, what is it that I want the voters in Alachua County to read in this article tomorrow so that they'll vote for me August 4th, 8th, 14th, okay. Yeah, the next one's September, I mean, November 6th. That's the next important one. But I got, um, you know, and, and what I finally came up with was embrace change. So that's one of the reasons that embrace, that change became my topic, too. I mean, from that point on, it's kind of been um, a focus point of what, of, of things I've been thinking about. How different things are, how, th how different things have been, um, how much has changed, how much is yet to change. And... Um, how important change really should be to us today. Um, embracing change is going to be the difference between, you know, success and failure for those of us that are going to continue to work professionally for, for whatever per period of time. Technology is just rushing it. I mean, it's coming on fast. And the cycle of change is speeding up. you got to stay with it. You're going to have to embrace it, you're going to have to figure out where it's going to be in order to be there when the train comes in. Okay. So let me go back a little bit and do a little bit of property tax history, because one of the potential you know, subtitles for this whole thing was, you know, Ed's cracked history of Florida property tax and views on appraisal valuation. Um, none of my notes are footnoted, okay? These are all my thoughts or they're my version of what I read or misread. You know, I mean, they're just, they're my thoughts. You have to hold me responsible for them. Um, but property taxes, okay? Property taxes are probably the oldest tax we have in the world. There's evidence um, of the property tax on clay tablets that date 6,000 years B.C. But one thing about that is property tax has always served as an ad hoc income tax. Back then, it was like production. You grow four bushels, I get one. Okay? I mean, the tax was based on, on your income, your ability to pay, your production. And it's always been kind of that way. It's been, you know, ad hoc income tax. Now, I don't think that model works very well anymore. I don't, I don't think um, Western economies um, well, where we are today has really ended up with any sort of direct connection between your ability to pay or your ability to afford to pay and the value of what you own. Um, some enterprises take huge capital with relatively low returns. You know, well, if it's going, to be, it's going to be a lot of capital, then theoretically it's worth a lot, so we're going to tax it for a lot. Well, if you're getting a relatively low revenue stream off of it, that doesn't work. Um, if you're the fifth generation person in a family farm, you know, the value of that farm today has nothing to do with your ability to produce income. You know, there's just there's no direct connection. So... I don't like the property tax for that reason. I don't like the way it's been set up. Um, I don't have an alternative. Local government is dependent upon it, anywhere from 60 to 100 percent in most cases. All right. Now, property tax has another component to it um, that I like to think about. You know, and a lot of people like to um, try to marry it to use, you know, or consumption. Well. 
I don't want to use the word consumption because I'm going to use it again later. But it has to do with, you know, is there some connection between what I'm paying and what I'm getting? You know, if I'm paying $1,000 in property taxes, what are the services that I'm getting? Am I getting $1,000 worth back? Maybe I'm a little sensitive to that because, you know, we hear that a lot. You know, well, you can't tax me that much. I, I, I live on a dirt road. I'm not getting those services. The ambulance won't get to me for 15 minutes, you know. I mean, you know, we hear a lot of that. But there, so, there, again, there's no connection. There's no direct connection between the two. There's, there's no connection between what, you're act, what value you're going to get from that tax or what service or good you're going to get from that tax and um, what the amount of that tax is going to be. So, again, I think um, that it's broken. I don't have an answer. Um, in fact, today I'm full of questions um, and not answers. Uh, I graduated Hobart in 1970, considerably before Chris. You know, they got my time for answers is on the downside. You know. Um, all right, let me let me go back to now a couple other things. You know. Uh, Property taxes have, have always been ad hoc on, va you know, on, on uh, value, ad hoc income taxes, okay? But, but dollars, so to speak, or money, haven't always been the currency of what we do. Uh, taxes have sometimes been assessed based on square footage, or cubic meters, um, front feet, even the number of windows in a building. Um, any of you that have been to um, Savannah? and done the historic tour of the Battery District. You've seen all the houses, they're real narrow on the street, but they go way back, very deep. Reason was, property taxes in Savannah when those homes were built were based on your front feet on the street. So, although property taxes, so to speak, are very, very old, devising ways to avoid property taxes are also very, very old. You know, I mean, they, that was the second thing. Right after coming up with the tax was somebody figuring out a way to get out of it. Now, a little bit about Florida's specific property tax history. Florida was the 27th state, came into the Union in 1845. From the very beginning, property appraisers, then called tax assessors, um, were in the Constitution. Um, it was not until 1972, I think, that our title was changed from tax assessor to property appraiser. And um, should you ever need a bit of useless trivia, I'm going to tell you what the difference between the two of them is, okay? A tax assessor gets certified by, like the Board of County Commissioners, um, an amount of money that they want to collect from the tax roll and the tax assessor calculates the millage rate to do that. A property appraiser tells the Board of County Commissioners how much value they have to levy against, and the county commissioners calculate the millage rate and certify that to the property appraiser. That's the difference. One of them calculates the millage rate and the other one doesn't. But for whatever, we change the name. Um, but anyway, we'll go back. We were very important. I mean, there are several features that, that, that are in the original Constitution are still there, and they, and they make a difference. Um, we had a 10 mil cap on tax rates. Still do. Nobody can go above that. The Constitution defined that values for property tax purposes will be at a just value. Now, that term's not defined. Constitutions are that way. They seldom do. You know, it's left up to the legislature to define that, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But right now, those are the three things we need. Um, so tax assessors in the early years, uh, being, you know, good public elected servants appraised everybody's value at a just value. 
it was pretty low. And one of the tax assessor's goals was to have that low tax base because what would happen is all the taxing jurisdictions would go to 10 mil cap. So what happens now? I mean, the next step is nobody can get any new money unless the tax assessor raises the values. So the tax assessor became very important. I mean, he's, you know, everybody wanted to talk with him. You know, the, the uh, superintendent of schools would come over, you know, he'd sit down, he'd, you know, you'd have coffee. He'd go, you know, uh, you know, the Smith twins are going to enter school this year. We're going to need a couple new desks. And uh, those two families moved in last year. They each have about 10 kids. We need some new money for pencil books. He said, um, we need you to raise the values so we can have those. You know, and a tax assessor would go, oh, yeah, I'll keep that in mind. Thanks very much for the Cuban cigar. It was legal then. And I'll see you. you know. Then the chairman of the Board of County Commissioners would come in and he'd go, well, Mr. Tax Assessor, he says, um, remember those storms we had back in the spring? He goes, you know, we still haven't been able to afford to, to repair those roads because we don't have any money. And um, Smitty's Lumber Yard burned down last fall because we didn't have any fire equipment. So it'd be real nice to have some of that newfangled fire equipment so we could handle those type of situations in the future, get those things fixed. You know, the tax assessor would go, okay, yeah, yeah. By the way, thanks for the bourbon. I'll see you Sunday in church. Everybody leave, and the tax assessor, now he's sitting there going, okay, let's see. I want to get reelected. Can't raise their values too much. I won't get reelected. But don't raise their values at all. Nobody gets any new money. Nobody gets any new money. Nobody gets any new services. I might not get reelected. You know, so what am I going to do? He goes, you know, I like those school kids, but if I raise the money for that, you know, the county commission gets that money too, and Smitty's never really supported me. I could care whether I get him a fire truck or not. You know, I mean, it's just, what am I worried about? That went on for a long period of time. Tax assessors had that kind of power in the state for a long period of time because they held everybody at 10 mils. Now, the other thing that happened that I'll tell you about early tax rules is, um, well, there's a couple of things. Uh, one is the law, uh, and it's pretty much unchanged today. The law was that you were expected to know that if you owned property, you owed taxes, and that those were due in November, and you had to come in and pay them. If you didn't come in and pay them, then you know it's a simpler process than today. But still, the repercussions were about the same eventually you lose your property. Okay. Now, the, the tax rule itself was um, just had names in the left-hand column. You know, sometimes it was alphabetical. Sometimes it was alphabetical by sections of the county. And whatever maps existed, if any existed, were very, very rudimentary. They were crude. So it was hard to tell where certain properties uh, were in the tax roll. Now, the two things created a couple more opportunities. You know, there, there are theories that some early tax assessors, in combination with clerks of court, um, were able to take advantage of some of these things to gain some personal wealth. I can't confirm or deny that. None of that's been chronicled. But I can tell you that this, you know, like, like the opportunity, even though I'm going to come back and tell you about ways that the things that were passed or changed to try to keep it from happening, still happened as late as the, late, as the 1970s. 
All right, now I'm going to tell you about David Reed, property appraiser in Palm Beach County. David, David was actually a very popular man in the industry. He was a progressive property appraiser, had a great reputation. Um, you know, he dressed really nice. He's one of those types of people that, you know, when they walk in a room, you like the whole room kind of feels his presence coming in. You know, sort of charismatic. Um, David, had, David got a girlfriend. But keep it simple. David got a girlfriend. And um, as will happen to married men that get girlfriends, he became homeless. Wife threw him out. He got divorced from both his wife and a large portion of his wealth. But he still had the girlfriend. And it turns out he had a white knight. You know, he had a good friend that was building a high-end shopping center in a really upscale subdivision. So it didn't take very long for David to be um, in a new home, very nice, fancy home, upscale neighborhood. Life is back, you know, things are going well. Um, didn't want the ex, maybe some others as well, maybe to see all of his income, so he opened some... Uh, bank accounts in Mississippi, because that, that was his girlfriend's home state. Opened them in her name over Mississippi. And everything was going splendid. You know, David's life was back on keel. And then one day, somebody came down to the office and made an inquiry about the tax bill on the shopping center. They couldn't find it. It wasn't there. I mean, the land wasn't there. The buildings weren't there. There was no tax bill. David, um, David went to Rayford, where they gave him a number of years to think about his public service. His girlfriend went back to Mississippi. David couldn't really make, lay any claim on any of that money in Mississippi because that really actually would have aggravated his situation. You know, they'd have just added some more charges at that point and never would have extended his stay in Rayford. So, oh, and the last thing is, um, when David got out, the girlfriend wasn't there to greet him. You know, I mean, it, but anyway, David went through a bunch of changes. Those things happened, and, and, that, and it still happened as late as the 70s. But, but I'll, I'll back up and tell you that um, um, what they did earlier than that, there's two things they did earlier than that, and, and they changed things to um, require that um, good mapping be done in all the offices. Accurate mapping, maybe we don't want to use accurate yet, accurate for the time, okay? So maps were produced, and they had the parcels on them, you know, polygons. They didn't have anything else, there'd just be a piece of paper there with a bunch of squares or circles or whatever the shape was. And um, so everybody said, okay, well, that's well and good. But who owns that? Well, in order to figure out who owns that, you kind of have to run, it, run that parcel out, figure out what the legal description is, and then start going through all the legal descriptions on tax roll, see if you could find it. So that, that wasn't very good. People didn't like that. So the next thing that happened is they started writing names on the maps. You know? So you, know, you want to find out what I own, you start leafing through all the maps until you find my name on a map. Well, if I own more than two properties, they weren't going to be listed together in a tax roll, okay? They were going to be in two different places, so you're going to, how do I find this, how do I find that? Um, eventually what they did is they adopted a requirement for a parcel identification number. Now, all of the... Um, 13 original, well, except for the 13 original counties. Every state has a government survey grid, you know, a matrix that's just, I mean, it's set up section tension, well, it's set up with a, you know, a zero intersection, then it goes um, ranges, townships, sections, 36 sections in a square mile. And, a, and there was a uh, industry standard for parcel number. And that standard was range, township, section, quarter section, quarter section quarter section until you got to the parcel. 
you could literally look at the parcel ID and know where that property was. You go to it on a map anyway, right? Now, I got to take a little diversion here. I went to work for my predecessor in 1977. In, um, in those early days, we would start, you know, a bunch of us would go to lunch together. And we'd drive up um, Northeast 2nd Street, we'd zip across 16th Avenue, and pull into the back of the western, you know, the back parking lot of the Western Sizzlin and go to lunch. The manager at the Western Sizzling was a buddy of one of the appraisers from the rugby club. That's why we went. We didn't get any deals. It's just that the more lunch he sold, the better his bosses liked him, so we would go to help support him. But we would pass this guy going up 2nd Street. And he's on one of those adult tricycles, you know, with the banana peel handlebars. I mean, he's just like, you know, he's riding like this. Got a little basket. You know, septuagenarian easy rider. This guy, I mean, and he's there all the time. I'm going, okay, he's got to have a story. Who is this guy? So one day I asked the guys I'm riding with, do any of you know who that guy is? And they go, oh, yeah. I said, that's Red Franks. Done me. The Claude M. Red Franks was my predecessor's predecessor. He was the tax assessor of Alachua County from 1953 to 1963. I'm going, and he's riding a tricycle in not the best section of town. I'm going, you know, this doesn't look too good. I looked into things, so I'm going to tell you another story. Um, Red was actually removed from office by the governor. Um, for mental incompetence is what they finally found on him. But Red was one of the people who don't like change. You know, change bothered him a lot. And uh, Red was property appraiser when Tallahassee mandated parcel number. Alachua County was one of the last ones to adopt it. Red fought it for a long time. And they finally, they came down and said, no, no. He said, you will put a parcel number on every parcel in Alachua County. Red, he didn't really say okay. He just kind of got angry. He stormed out of the building, went across Main Street into Parker's office supply, and started talking with Flake Parker. Flake was his given name, I promise you. I didn't make this up. Flake's the one who told me the story. Um, now, he just starts ranting. I mean, he launches into this diatribe about, you know, the, the sanctity and sovereignty of constitutional officers and their power from the, from the Constitution, and the state's got no rights of interfering, telling them how to do anything. We don't need parcel numbers. There's no way to benefit for the citizens of this county. It's just going to cost them money. All at the, all at the same time, that he's buying one of those automatic number stampers, you know, one, two, three. When he gets done, he goes back to the office. Range 17 is our westernmost range. He goes to the northernmost section in range 17, which would be our northwesternmost parcel in the county. And he opens the map and he goes, one. Goes back forth, section one through six, turn the corner, come on back, seven through 12, you know, all 36, right on down range 17, move over to range 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, until he gets to the southeast corner of the county. And that is the origin of our parcel number system in Alachua County, the one we still have today, and why it makes no logical sense, okay? I mean, that's, you know, now these things happen. They happen all the time. It's a wonderful world. Um, I'm going to drop that part. Um, yeah, I want to go into a couple more things about Florida property taxes. Um, 
If any of you own property, you know just about any place you are, the largest, part, lar largest portion, portion of that tax bill is going to be your school board taxes. Almost everywhere you go. Alachua County is occasionally one of the exceptions, but most everywhere you go, it's always the school board. All right? Now, Florida was hit badly in the real estate bust of the 1920s, which was immediately followed by the Great Depression of 29. So we had a, you know, we had a, a double hit. Um, some people had come into Florida in the early 1920s and built some horse racing tracks. But in our wisdom, we knew that was immoral. So we made betting illegal. I think what they actually ended up doing is, okay, they, sh they somehow sold like shares of stock that corresponded to a particular horse in a particular race. I don't, anyway, they worked around it. But anyway, you know, when we, when we, uh, um, when we passed that new set of laws that clearly made betting illegal in Florida, it um, put, you know, put these horse track owners in a bit of a problem. So um, keep in mind that we do a just value, and that's from the Constitution. The last thing you need, well, maybe not the last thing, but the next thing you need to know about the Constitution is it reserves property taxes for local government. There's a prohibition from the state using a property tax, our state anyway. They can't do it. So in 1931, the legislature makes a deal with the horse track owners to legalize some betting in Florida in return for taxing the, you know, taxing the betting. And they got voter approval on it, or they got public approval on it, by sending that money to the local governments to help offset the costs of education, K through 12. Now, that put the state in the education business. All right? Up until then, educating your children was a county function. Okay? But when the state started sending money down, it involved the state. Now, it doesn't take a legislature very long to look at the opportunity to correct all the ills in the world uh, with purse strings. You know, I mean, as soon as we're sending that money down, members of the legislature are passing things. Okay, if you're going to take the money, then you're going to at least do this, or you're going to do that, you're going to do that. Um, now, I'm going to jump ahead. Actually, the timing is going to be out of sequence, but you kind of need to know this fact for, for what's going to go on. But uh, there comes along uh, a class action suit over the equal, equalized education, K through 12. I think it actually happened in Texas, but it went on up to the Supreme Court, got ratified, became the law of the land, and it's still what we operate under today. And the court said that you have to educate everybody equally. Now, that was interpreted to mean you have to give them the same dollars per student. Back then, it was a little simpler than it is today. You know, an FTE, full-time equivalent, was each one of us was one. Now, an FTE in the public school system, not necessarily a body. One body might be three. Another body might be three quarters. That's somebody else's presentation. But anyway, it's important to understand um, that, that, um, that that court case came down and said you have to... Um, Equalize, you know, you have to deliver equal education to everybody. All right. Now, remember, our property appraisers, our tax assessors, they're doing the just value thing, they're trying to keep everybody at 10 mils, trying to make certain they never have to buy their own bourbon, cigars, or coffee. You know, I mean, you know. Well, when the states started sending money down and there had to be some sort of equalization, it didn't take them long to realize that some counties were getting more per pupil than the other because of the money being raised from school taxes. So they had to change something. But what they did is they, they, um, um, 
they created an RLE, required local effort. And what the required local effort is, is it's a millage rate. It's a millage rate that the school board locally must levy in order to participate in that fund of monies that comes down from Tallahassee to pay for education. Now, it's far more than the gambling money, but the gambling money was the first big pot. Um, so, remember, the state can't do a property tax, right? The legislature sets the millage rate for the, for the school board, required local effort in every county every year. And if, and if that county wants to participate, because it's optional, if you want to participate in the state handing out of the money, you must levy that tax rate. Well, that really still didn't equalize things because Gilchrist County wasn't doing as good a job at getting that adjust value as some others. You know? They found out that the counties were uneven. So they passed a whole bunch of new laws which essentially gave the state, well, the, 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 what they did is they said they, they gave the state the power to set um, a level of, of assessment and, um, and actually some equity measures in there as well. And the power to approve or disapprove tax rolls. Well, everybody's budget is being funded by Board of County Commissioners. Board of County Commissioners said, we're not going to do that. We're not going to give that tax assessor the money to do what you're saying. We're not going to raise our values. We don't really think you have the right to tell us to either. And um, the state thought about it. They came down, they sort of talked to the counties, and they said, is this really how you feel? They said, yeah, that's how we feel. You don't have any right to do this and you shouldn't be here saying these things. They said, well, the state went home and in its um, style passed a law. Said, okay, from now on, all the tax assessor or property appraiser budgets will be approved by Tallahassee. And all the boards of county commissioners will have to fund them no matter what we approve. And that's still the law today, by the way. But that's how it came about. Counties wouldn't, counties wouldn't comply, so the state passed a law to force them to comply. Um, values started going up a lot, right? I mean, now that the state has this power, values are going up a lot. Uh, the state's calculating that required local effort every year. They're equalizing rates. Um, and things are rocking along until like 1978. Bob Graham becomes governor of the state of Florida. One of Bob Graham's big things was education. And getting tax rolls right. You know, as a developer, he, under he had a pretty good understanding of where the values were on his properties versus the money he was getting for them when he was selling them. And he put the pressure on. He hired a young man named, uh, um, golly, I cannot believe I forgot this guy's name. He was a, he's a great friend of mine. But anyway, to head up Department of Revenue back then. Randy Reed, uh, Randy, um, Randy Miller. And, um, I mean, Randy Miller, he put the pedal down. He said, okay, folks. Now, that's also when my predecessor decided, okay, that's enough. He retired. I ran in 1980. Um, but, so here's what's happened, okay. In, in 1933, we'd passed a $5,000 homestead exemption because, you know, our economy's flat. We wanted to invite everybody to move to Florida and essentially live tax-free. Well, in 1978, all of a sudden, in 79, we're putting the pedal to the metal. We're, these values are like doubling or tripling or quadrupling. They're going through the roof. And guess what? 
Nobody's changing the millage rate. So the taxes are just going. At that point in time, the governor was in a little bit of trouble. I mean, the media was knocking him pretty hard. People didn't like it, so he needed a circuit breaker. In 1980, he proposed and we passed moving the homestead exemption to $25,000. But instant relief. Now all of a sudden, all the voters didn't care anymore. They had a $25,000 homestead exemption, and values were up. And those people who didn't have a homestead exemption were still stuck with those quadrupled values. Um, oh, market value. OK. Now remember I told you just value is, is, the, is the constitutional standard. The statutes actually have eight criteria in them of things that we're supposed to consider in arriving at just value. But there's no definition that says like just value will be 90% of market value or just value will be. It just says here's eight things you have to consider. Typically those things are comprised in three approaches to value and um, you would take them into account under normal circumstances anyway. But what you're going to hear is that Florida is a market value state. We appraise everything at market value. That's what the law is. Well, that's a judicial standard. See, I think the legislature tomorrow could, act, could pass a new definition. They have that power. The market value is a judicial standard. The courts decided in Florida what the level of assessment is going to be. They're the ones that set it at market value. Okay, so Randy Miller's up there. He's pushing everybody to raise their values. And what we're doing is um, statistical analysis to tell whether everybody's at 100% or not, you know, where they're supposed to be. Now remember back to your statistics courses for a minute. Okay? Whatever your amount of equity is defines the shape of your curve, right? So if you've, if you've got really good equity, you've got a bell curve. And if it's really good, you've got a really narrow bell curve. Okay? And if you've got a perfect level of assessment, the apex of that curve is at 100%. Now think for a minute about everything on the right-hand side of that apex. It's all over 100%. It's got to be. You know? So here we go again. I mean, the papers, you know, I mean, there were literally people, people were being overpraised, overassessed. Papers were tearing it up, and the assessors were going, they said I had to. Tallahassee says I got to do this. It's by, it's by rule or law. Half the people in the county have got to be overassessed. Now, let's just say that was, that was not voter friendly. Okay, so again, um, we needed a circuit breaker. And, what the, what, and the shape that this one was, remember I told you there's eight criteria for us to consider? Well, it was the addition of the eighth. The eighth criterion essentially says that when we look at a sales price, in order to determine just value we're allowed to subtract from that sales price normal costs of the transaction which allowed that apex to move down from 100% to some other level. And then the Department of Revenue issued a ruling that said, and by the way, if you use 15% or less, you don't have to write a justification up for us. Guess what every property appraiser in, Alaska, in, in, in Florida used? 15%. You know? Why am I going to appraise anybody any higher than a what essentially they tell me I can get away with. So if you ever hear that Florida doesn't really appraise it at 100%, it's at 85%, that's where that came from. Now under the right circumstances, I'll deny all of this because the test is still, still market value. You know, if we're in court over a single property, market value. That's what the judicial standard is. Forget the 85%. Um, a couple quick, um, yeah, some observations on, on, you know, that's the rate side of things or the, or the value side of things. 
Okay, on the, on the taxes or the rate side of things, how'd we get there? Um, it's pretty simple, you know, it's a, uh, but here's the important thing I want you to take. When you decide how much money you want to spend, you've decided how many taxes you're going to collect. Okay? When you set the budget, you've set the amount of taxes. Everything else you do after there just changes who's paying them. Okay? So you want to talk, you know, whenever you hear politicians talking about lowering your taxes, we're give, you know, unless they're talking about changing the, the, the size of the spending pie, they're talking about something other than lowering taxes. Normally they're talking about moving them, okay, from me to somebody else. In fact, I've tried to convince them for years that for the property appraiser to set his own value, there's an inherent conflict of interest that we need a legislative bill to just exempt me so we don't have that sort of problem. They don't buy that. I don't know why. Anyway, so let's, so, so okay. Taxes are, are real simple. You decide how much money you want to you want to um, collect or spend, and you divide it by the amount of money you have to levy against. That gives you millage rate. I'm going to tell you one last little thing um, on that. Oh, well, okay. So, Once the taxes are set, you know, if every one of us paid an equal portion of it, then that would be equity, at least by some definition. But we're not going to do it that way. You know, we're going to use it as an ad hoc income tax. So we're going to apportion it based on your percentage of value of the total values. You know, you own 1%, then you're going to pay 1% of the taxes. Um, and theoretically, if you buy the whole ad hoc income tax theory, there's equity there, but we're not going to stop there, you know. I mean, if every one of us in the room, you know, took out a dollar and we said, okay, here's the tax thing, you know, what I'm going to tell you is, okay, well, wait a minute, before we do that, you're going to be a church. Put your dollar back in your pocket. Everybody take out enough change to make up for his dollar because we've got to move it to somebody else, okay? But, oh, you're a charitable organization. Put your dollar back in. We've got to split his up. We're going to come back over here. Ah, he's a farmer. We've got to give him a special value, so we've got to take a portion of this. You put 75 cents back in your pocket because you're only going to have to pay a quarter, and the rest of us have to split his 75 cents up. And that's what happens. You know, that's what we do. That's what exemptions do. That's what classified values do. And I will tell you from a purist point of view, the only one that makes sense to me is the one that saves bookkeeping, okay? If we were to assess taxes on a county administration building, every one of us would have to pay those taxes and, every, and then that bill would be paid, okay? So why do the bookkeeping? Right. I just, there's no, no reason for it. Um, that makes sense to me. Everything else is social engineering and social engineering you can make your own mind up about. I'm not going to go there. I will tell you over the past several years, you've heard a lot in the, in the news um, about the legislature passing different things to save people money. Um, I think there's even some additional constitutional amendments this fall that will save people money. None of them make the spending, none, none of them have ever gone toward talk about the spending pie to begin with. So, you know, by definition, they're all going to miss the target by some degree. But here's the interesting thing. Remember, the state's paying for education. Every one of the ones that they've done over the last five or six years exempts the school board millage rate. So they didn't take any money out of their pocket. You know. They said, okay, yeah, Board of County Commissioners, you're not going to be able to get as much because you know, they're going to uh, give you an additional $25,000 homestead exemption but we're not going to make up that for school board money. Nah. And that's the way it continues to be. Um, to me, man, yeah, that's just dishonest to me. But, um, there was one last thing I was going to tell you about in that area. But let's move on to, to appraisals. 
I think about it, I'll come back to it. I, I think the appraisal theory is fundamentally bro broken. I, I, think, I think it's time for some major changes. You know, the last change I, I can remember in appraisal theory is when we added replacement cost to the cost approach instead of just reproduction cost. And I was young when that happened. We haven't updated anything in appraisal theory since then. And I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed this up. But um, let's just think about, think about the cost approach. Here's some things you're going to, you know, A, you're going to be told or taught you're going to get the highest value with the cost approach. If that's true, why would anybody build anything? You know, I mean, if, if it's not worth more when I finish building it than it costs me to build it, why would I build it? How do we already get all these buildings? You know, I mean, that doesn't even make any sense. How can that be the highest approach to value? Now it's based on substitution. Well, in this day and age, anybody familiar with the permitting process? You know, especially on a commercial project, you know what you're going to go through, how long it's going to take. I mean, in a good county, you'll get it done in nine months. Latchford County take you three years. It's going to cost you a lot of money. You know? Have you seen the time value of money analysis and a cost approach over the permitting process? You don't usually see it. Although I, do, I, although I think I can think of one time when I did. But that was because the purpose of the appraisal was to gather some money from, a, from the delays. But, um, you know, I mean, those concepts, it's not fully accounting for everything that's truly going on in the marketplace. Um, the cost approach has all those depreciations in it. You know, how subjective can you get? What's the effect of age of that building? You know, we got seminars on it. And if I could remember, I'd tell you how to go out there and, and do it. But I mean, that's a, it's a subjective call. I mean, how many, what, was, what was the age of the building? When, well, the building codes say, you know, we're building stuff to a uh, 60 uh, year standard. If we put it up and we leave it alone, 60 years it'll be dust. You know, we never do anything with it. So that, that's what the building code standard is. Well, no, it's actually 100 years. Oh, well, then we have to change all our. We don't change them, you know. We don't agree on these things. We don't use them. We, we don't, you know, functional depreciation, physical depreciation, economic depreciation. They're judgmental. And they vary from appraiser to appraiser. I mean, it just, if you can't produce a value from one appraiser to another that's pretty close, what good's the appraisal process? I, I mean, it just, it bothers me, okay? Like I said, I only have questions today. I don't have answers. So let me back up a step and talk about the marketplace. Okay. Now, it seems to me the only, the only way that any appraisal valuation um, really works is if you have a market in equilibrium, essentially a perfect market. Okay. Everybody in that marketplace is buying and selling with the same motivations as everybody else. And the test is value and price will be the same. Okay. Now, the stock market works that way every day for us. You know? Somebody says, uh, what's the value of Apple computers? What was it? Six, huh? 679. Okay. We can all agree. You know? That's the price. We can all pick up something. Actually, we can go to the second floor. Right? We can look on that banner as it'll come by. We can all agree that's what it's worth. It's also what the price is. In appraisal, price and value are very, very, very different concepts. Which also leads us then to develop insurance values, asset values, tax values. Um, how many other different values? I mean, you have to, you have, now you have to identify it in your appraisal report. Which value are you after? How can one piece of property 
have six different values. And I, you know, what sort of an economic principle would provide for that? That doesn't make sense. I mean, if it's worth $100,000, it should be worth $100,000 to Terry as well. You know, the fact that he's in insurance shouldn't change the value. But it does in our world, and we accept that. I don't. I don't think you should. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, a, a couple of examples. I don't know. Does anybody have any questions before I run out of time just ranting up here on you? All right, a couple of examples of, of, that, of that sort of principle. Um, a friend of mine was relating to me a story of selling his house that he owned before he got married. And um, it was in a good neighborhood, but it was one of those market downtimes, you know, like the early 90s when we had another one of these recessions. And it was a two-bedroom house in a neighborhood that's norm the norm was three-bedroom homes. You know, he's educated in real estate. He, he knew, okay, so, well, you know, two-bedroom house, it's going to take a while to sell. Two-bedroom homes aren't worth as much as three-bedroom homes. But, you know, I got it free and clear. I don't go on my honeymoon. I don't really need to sell it. He said, I'm just going to test the market out. What I'll do is I'm going to put it on the market for about 20% more than what I know it's worth as a three-bedroom house. So he put a sign in his front yard and add in the paper. Sold it in two days for his asking price. Okay, what was the buyer's motivation? You know, I, well, oh, okay, I'll come back. The buyer's motivation was the house next door belonged to his mother. His mother had been diagnosed with a disease that says that she was going to need some long-term care. He had been looking for a house to get close to his mother for weeks. When that house came up immediately next door to his mother, no questions asked, jumped on it. You know, he had a consumptive use for it. My terminology, I don't know anybody else that uses it. So I think you know, one, of the, one of the differences here is we predicate all the appraisal theory on everybody's going to operate on an investment um, use, decision-making matrix. And I suggest to you that that's not true. There's actually a very, very small number of people in the market for real property who actually buy on investment standards, you know, on the old return on and return of capital sort of analysis and, and time analysis. Very, very small amount. Multifamily market, okay, everybody. But, you know, outside of that. So, you know, that guy's value, you know, he wouldn't worry about what he was going to get for that house when his mother died. He was worried about what he needed then. Now, my other example here is commercial property. Now, think about it. Dollar General has a distribution center up in Alachua. Well, I forgot to tell you that, um, you know, the manager of that Western Sizzling we used to go to? There's a guy named Rick Robertson. Okay? He now owns Conestoga's restaurant up in, in beautiful downtown Alachua. And you see him on your television all the time because he's out looking for his sister. You know, the guy in the funny, weird, blonde wig. That was the manager. Anyway, coming back to... Um, Dollar General. Dollar General wants to build a distribution center. It's going to have a million square feet under roof. Does anybody seriously think that they sat down and made an investment analysis before they bought that piece of property and built that property? Do you think they spent any time at all discussing, analyzing, or wondering what kind of money they were going to get for that property when they're done with it? No. They're working on a business model. Same as CVS and Walgreens. You see them pay these astronomical prices? They don't care what it costs. The cost of the real property is a business expense to them. You know, Dollar General set up you know, on-time delivery schema where they need a place for those flats to come in that get divided into, uh, 
you know, get divided up and then a certain number of things from that flat go into this container along with things from that flat and, 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 and then that container goes to that store. You know, they need a place for all those things to come in, bust them down, and then send them out. That's their business model. They recover the cost of that distribution center from the sales of the products in the stores that get delivered to them. You know? You know, what's it worth? You know, the answer is I don't know. I've been sued several times and I still don't know. I'm working on it, but I'll tell you what I do know. In the case of the house, you're the lender. It's subpar for the neighborhood. And um, the price you agreed on is 20% uh, above market. So you're probably 25% or so over uh, what the appraisal is going to come in. Uh, so the best you're going to get is about a 50% loan. Now, in the case of Dollar General, what you do is you spend, I think it was, um, I think it was $38 million building it. You then turn around, you sell it for $68 million in a sale lease back. You get a $52 million mortgage on it, and when the courts are done, the value is $38 million. I don't know how to explain that. But that's, that's the rules, you know. I mean, that's where it is. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, I mean, the answer, Dollars General's strength as a um, person of credit or a person that's going to pay drives that equation. You know, if you've got $68 million and you've got Dollar General promising to pay you every month the rate of return that you want and you've got that corporation standing behind it, you go, sure, why not? Especially if you can borrow 52 of it at favorable interest rates, you know. So, you know, my suggestion to the lending market, because really in the real estate market now, in order for us to, to totally recover, we really need changes in the lending market. Um, lending practices, I think, are holding up our recovery more than any other single thing right now, um, and especially in regards to um, uh, potentially bank regulations. Um, so I would suggest that, you know, we need, we need to revamp a lot of what the lending market is doing. You know, they used to have, what, the five C's? They used to be the credo. Um, character, capacity, um, hmm? no, we're measuring the credit worthiness. Now I'm going to have to find my notes. Where did I say that? I know it, it's... Um, it's, it's character, capacity, conditions, collateral, and, and, all right, who knows. Um, oh, well. We'll find it some other time. Anyway, I would suggest to you that those are still, um, still good values for lending. And we used to do it a lot. But I'd also suggest to you that one of the problems has been computers, is how do you quantify character? You know, what the markets want today is information they can analyze quickly. So what's happened is, We've altered our business processes, our business decisions, and the, and the way we do things to accommodate the weaknesses of programmers and programs. You know, you got, um, you know, there's no way that Dollar General transaction makes it through the underwriter in a computer program. No way. But when you put it in context and you see what you got to deal with, as an individual investor, you step right up. I'll take some of that, you know. And I do have a context story for you, because you guys know this guy. Um, years ago, actually in the early 70s, I suppose, no, mid-70s, maybe, um, 
A friend of mine was a graduate student here at the University of Florida in real estate. And um, many of the professors had uh, participated in, a, in an investment in land. And the general partner was not delivering what was promised. It wasn't happening. So the fellow that was a student kind of, you know, got wind of this. And he finally got one or two of the, the partners to uh, let him look over the financials that were being sent out. And um, it didn't take him long to look at the financials to go, well, he says, I don't know what the problem is. I don't know why the partners aren't getting anything, but he says, Ed, they got all the money in the bank. We need to make this deal run. He said, all I need to do is talk a couple of the partners into selling me their interests if I can do what I think I can do if I get enough votes. And he got those agreements. He had, you know, the professors signed their voting rights over to him and, you know, said, you know, if he got enough of them to take over this land uh, deal, that um, he could buy them out at an agreed upon price. And he did it. And then he used the bank, the partnership already had, he, had, he used the money the partnership already had in the bank to pay everybody. And the only one who wasn't happy was the general partner because he'd gotten kicked out. You know, but everybody else was really, really happy. And he was off and running, you know. That was, now I, I point out to you that he was a student at the time because students don't have any money. He didn't have capital to do this, okay? Now, I'll tell you the other thing. He kept asking me, you know, like I was a doofus. He goes, Ed, why aren't you playing with me? Come on, get off the sideline. And I go, I don't know. But I can tell you, I still don't know why I didn't play with him because there's a world of difference between where he is today and I am as a tax assessor. Um, and the other thing I'll tell you is I now live on a piece of that land. The other part I'll tell you about this is, is creditworthiness. You know, and they're talking about we're talking about underwriting and lending problems and challenges. How about borrowing money? Let me see. If you don't have much of a track record, and you want to borrow money on a vacant newspaper building in an abandoned downtown area, where are you going to get that loan? Well, if you all don't know who I'm talking about, I'm talking about Ken and Linda McGurn. I'm talking about Ken McGurn, okay? I mean, they did it. They made downtown what it is today. But they also took over that land trust and a couple others. And there were a couple other students out here, Dennis Lee, Jim Jean, um, that did similar things <laughs> at the same time, all of which I was offered an opportunity to participate in, and I sh showed the wisdom to not do. Um, I have a similar Nathan Collier stories too. I can remember when Nathan and I were talking and I had the net worth on him hands down. Okay. That didn't last a whole lot long, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Now, um, I, I mean, I literally used almost all of your time. I never even got to the income approach and the sales comparison approach, but I have similar problems. You know, the market's imperfect. They're reacting to different things. You go into that sales comparison approach, okay, what are the three comps that were chosen? Well, that was a subjective decision. Well, appraisals are an opinion, you know, just an opinion of value. Well, if they're an opinion of value, why do we rely on them? Well, because, you know, they're professional. Well, okay, if it's a professional opinion, when a loan goes bad, why isn't the appraiser being asked to pay for it? You know, I mean, I want these things to make sense. They don't make sense to me. All right? And, and, and they don't make sense because there's just too many variables. There's too many variables. I, I'll, I'll tell you, um, I mean, the same thing with the income approach. Big one in the income approach, approach is cap rates. You know? I mean, if you had enough um, dots on dice, or maybe just need additional dice, you know, throwing them up against the wall and reading the number that came up is as good a way to get a cap rate as any. You know? I, I mean, you know, I mean, cost of capital is a big component of a cap rate. And 
capital doesn't cost Ken McGurn what it costs me. You know, he gets different access and he gets a different rate. Okay, and that's true for every one of us. So, is property change value because you're the potential buyer versus you? Does that make sense? Cap is the big driver of value. If it doesn't make sense, I mean, those, okay, so I, I need to drop back. I need to go. Um, anyway, those are the questions that I have. I think, um, I think the basis of a lot of our economic theories today are based on Keynesian economics. Keynes died in 1946, okay? He was born in like 1853. He essentially lived the same years as the Industrial Revo Revolution. He took the, the thoughts and the theories of the, uh, uh, of the philosophers and theoreticians before him, uh, you know, going all the way back to Adam Smith. He added to them and, and, and came up with a, an additional set of, of theories. He had a different paradigm, a different perspective than any of those earlier people. You know, mass production wasn't even imaginable to some of those generations. The ability so, to so quickly produce surplus, which becomes a key component, just didn't exist. But Keynes lived it, he knew it, so he was able to incorporate that into where he was. He was a good mind, he developed that stuff. But folks, that's a long time ago. We've had another revolution since, and nobody stepped up that I know of, right? Somebody needs to. Somebody please ask a question. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, you'll have to excuse me, I have a hearing problem. Can you? Oh. Okay. Okay. Right now. Yeah. Right now I have one lawsuit. It's with the Hilton Conference Center. They sued me. And I have um, three contemplated lawsuits where I will be suing um, the property owners. Uh, one is uh, Vulcan Materials, Florida Rock, um, out in Newberry, on tangible property. The other is the Hilton Conference Center, and uh, the third one is, the, is Sears. Uh, that's the full extent of the lawsuits that I have dealing with property tax right now. I do have one in federal court that has to do with disability, disability exemption. Uh, no, that's yeah. Property owners. Very rare no. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, in order to. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Those those type of appeals we get about twenty five hundred three thousand a year. Right. Okay. There, um, here's what I'll tell you happens with most of them. You got to remember, do you, do you know about Save Our Homes? Okay. In a lot of cases, we can lower your value 10%. It won't change your taxes one bit. Because of the savings from Save Our Homes that's still there, all it does is eat into your increment of deferred value. So um, we have a lot of cases of, of that. People come in, um, you know, they get that tax rep to come in and, and talk about it. Their properties, we find out that there's something there, that there's actually a valid point, and we'll lower their value, but they don't get anything in return. They don't get any savings for it. We get better data, and, and that's of real interest to us because the accuracy of our data is, you know, once we know our data is really accurate, that gives us confidence to make the other decisions that we need to do. Inaccurate data will kill us you know, in a heartbeat. Um, another a, a really small group is, um, you remember when you come in and you ask us to look at your property because something might be wrong, 
It's like a barroom door. It swings both ways. If there's something wrong, we're going to correct it. If it means your value goes up, it's going up. And we've actually had a few of those people bring properties in that they didn't look at carefully enough. They didn't say back to the owner, you know, you probably need to to never let the property appraiser know you even exist because he's missing some value. And if he comes out here, he's going to find it. You know, we've had a few of those. But by far the most of them are nothing wrong. What we're actually, yeah. we're looking at a, at a um, potential system right now to, to add to our internet site that would um, allow people 24-7 to file a, um, an inquiry or a complaint about their property. Um, cause, so those people that, say, work during the same time that we do, so they can't get off and come and talk to us or or they can't make that phone call or whatever, give them access to us. But it'll also give you time, you know, in your off time or on the weekends when you have time and you say, you know what, I'm curious. Well, we're looking at a system where we'll be, where we can put it, if we can put it in place, would actually allow people to put it in. And it'll be, and it'll be like Sheila was saying, it, 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 it'll be a free service that just, you know, we'll respond to. And um, I think that's probably the next biggest improvement that, that um, well, we've got some other improvements that are going to hit the internet site first, but that'll be the next biggest one. Right now we're trying to convert the whole appraisal system. It's a two-year project. We're about halfway through. So there's a lot, there's a lot of things we can't do until we get finished because <laughs> there's nothing to hook it up to. You know, the, the, anything else? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. you, 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 you made a little jump in logic on me. We moved from lending practices to lenders. I don't have any specific ones in place, okay? Um, I'll tell you some of the, uh, and, I don't, and some of these may be, I mean, I have lenders tell me horror stories. Um, you have, we have businesses here in town that have been in business for, say, three generations of family. Been in the same location, three generations. They're not going anywhere. 2005, they refinanced the business. You know, they took a bunch of money out of the real property. They got a new mortgage. Well, lending practices now say commercial loans won't extend beyond five years, right? So five years passes. Now, these people have had the same banking relationship for three generations. They've got money in the bank. They live in this community. They're not going anywhere. They've never missed a payment. They're never going to miss a payment. But now the five years rolls up, and it's 2012 if I, did, if I picked the right years, okay? Well, in order to roll the loan, we've got to have a new appraisal. Guess what? They're upside down in the property. And the lending practices now say you got to have a commercial. Anybody know what it is? It's at least 30%. You've got to have at least 30% equity. Okay? So they're being told that they have to come up with this huge amount of cash. Or they have to lose the property and foreclose. Those are their choices. Those are the choices for the bank, 
the choices for the borrower because of lending practices that are in place. And our bankers here in town saw some of that. I don't know if you ever get any classes where you have bankers coming in, but there are some bankers who will tell you some horror stories. I mean, it's crazy. You take a viable business that's been, you know, been there for three generations, it's going to be there for another three. And you're going to kick them out. You know, you're going to throw them out of business and out of their property and put them in public humiliation for foreclosure because of a banking regulation. You know, makes sense. I mean, those, I mean, those type of things are out there. They're going on right now. It's not good. You had a question. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a lot. Um, we're going to end up paying about seven hundred thousand. Okay, and that was the cheap bid. Um, actually, when I went out to bid on the project, I told everybody in the business, you know, here's what I got. I can pay you a hundred thousand dollars a year. I can pay you that hundred thousand dollars a year for a while, but I can't pay you anymore. Only one company came back with the response to that bid that met that criteria. They also, they also happened to be an excellent company, so I was really happy with that decision. Um, but uh, from there, it went up to uh, I don't know, several million, at least two million, um, and in most cases. We've got about 100,000 real properties and, and, and another 15,000 um, tangible properties. Um, in most cases, we would, most companies are going to be bidding between you know, 1.2 and 2 million for a jurisdiction our size to do a new system. Now, um, what's wrong with that is, 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 is you're probably going to have to buy one of those every seven to eight years. You know? Ours happens to be 20 years old. If any of you all know what a green screen is, we're still working on green screens, <laughs> okay? Um, so it's not quite that bad for us. Um, but I will tell you, you know, my, my prediction is what will happen is uh, that so many of us are using these things and they're getting so very, very expensive um, is that we will uh, perfect them in the public realm so that they'll become free to each other. And the vendors will be, you know, they'll, they'll go, well, wh what happened? Well, you priced yourself out of the market. What happened? But, um, but I, I predict the next, um, well, it's already starting. I mean, it's already going on. You know, people are saying, I'm not going to spend that kind of money. I mean, I looked at my vendors, and I said, you've got to be kidding me. I said, have you guys, you know, just in case you've never been there, 13 blocks down the street from me is a place they call the University of Florida. There's people out there that could write your program blindfolded, you know? Now, if I told them down there that I've got half a million dollars, I would have a program in about 17 weeks. Yeah. Um, the big problem for somebody to just bid on that is, is you've got to have something to show, show, okay? Too many of us have been burned by people that had potential, but they never had the ability to get there. It's very, the, um, I didn't say anything about automated valuation models, but I, but I really do think they're a big part of our future. And, you know, what I was going to tell you about the sales approach is there's another thing that another friend of mine relates to me. He came to me recently, he says, Ed, he says, how do you like that sales approach? I said, okay. He says, he says well, he says, um, I was thinking about doing an R-square test on it. Now, do you all remember what your R-square test is in statistics? It tests for accuracy, you know, how close to, you know, your, your objective did you really come or something like that. He says, he says you know, I was thinking about it. He says, what do you think is going to come out better on an R-square test? My computer algorithm that used 100 properties or that for the guy who used three and he manipulated the data.
to use them. Which one do you think is going to pass that R-square test better? Well, I'll tell you, you know, computers are made to deal with statistics, so the computer's going to win. Not that it would actually be a bit necessarily a better result, but I think, but I think they're going to be. I mean, they're poo-pooed. The industry doesn't like them right now, especially all those people that are going to be replaced in them. Um, I think that the comments that I had to say are, are kind of harsh on appraisal. But remember, I am one. I'm proud that I'm one. Um, I think those, um, well, I'll tell you, in the early 90s, when we had another one of these little recessions, I was actually working with a group with Fannie Mae. You know, we're up in Washington, D.C., and we're going through these meetings. They're going, yeah, we're trying to s resolve this, you know, issue of appraisals and what are we going to do and, and just how bad is the world. And, uh, and a guy from Fannie Mae says, you know, it's been our experience that we don't really need appraisals. In fact, he says, this real estate market is so perfect that 98% of the time, the sales price is the appraised value. So, oh, really? <laughs> Imagine that, <laughs> you know, okay, well, you know, the appraiser had the sales price, you know. Um, the form appraisals, short form appraisals that are being done, uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, most of those, I think they're the first four letters of my last name, okay? They're just, they're no good. I, I, I don't think, they're, they're tor they've got way too many variables in them. And, and it can't be relied upon. AVM's got to step in someplace and take that place in the financial market. Now, narrative appraisal. A narrative appraisal is where you're going to be able to tell a good appraiser from a not so good appraisal. Go to where they talk about the general economic environment. I mean, it'll be my contention as a lender that you don't even really care about their result, what that number is. Okay. Now you're going to you, you care about their character and their capacity, you know, some of those things a lot. But go to that general economic trend, because mm -hmm. if they're doing a good job, they will tell you what the market is doing, where that property is located, what the market's going to be doing, where that market is located, and a good economic analysis there, I think, is more valuable than probably any other single thing a good appraiser does. And as a lender, I think, you know, you can go into that and you say, okay, wait a minute. You know, if I lend this guy $80,000 on $100,000, but I know, or I've got pretty good evidence, that three years from now, it's going to be worth $115,000. And he would have reduced the principal a little bit, you know. For the life of my loan, my risk ratio is just going to improve. It's just going to keep getting better and better and better. You know, it's that economic analysis. It's the context. You know, I think, you know, we, we can't get computers to read, analyze, and deal with context. You know, context is just too subjective. You know, I mean, a, a computer would have never read, read the information that Ken McGurn saw in, in those financials that the partners had. You know, to him it was like headlights, I mean, bright lights, you know, high beams. You're just like, whoa, you know, <laughs> this is easy. Um, so it's context, and, and I think that economic environment analysis from the general down to the local that a good appraiser will do in your narrative appraisal, I think will tell you more about the property and the viability of a lending decision than any other single document you can get a hold of. And I'm keeping you past time according to that clock. I've, I have appreciated the opportunity to be here. Um, I'll hang around if anybody's got any other questions for a little bit, um, but thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity.